you may be seated. If you wish to take your Bibles and turn to those two different passages that we uh, read just a few moments ago, you may do so. I think that when God chose the lion to speak symbolically in Scripture, he chose an animal that would be known and understood around the world. And this is certainly an appropriate ending for our annual summer youth rally, the lion of the tribe of Judah, for that speaks of Jesus Christ. That's a lion that is actually understood around the world because lions are everywhere. From the mountain lions of North America, to European lions, to Middle Eastern lions, which have been hunted to extinction, to African lions, to lions raised in captivity in Rome for the purpose of eating Christians, to Scandinavia and Russia, those did have lions at one time, though they're now extinct. Did you know that even Alaska and Yukon Territory at one time had lions, though they have been hunted to extinction. There were lions across Europe, the Balkans, the Italian Peninsula, southern France, the Iberian Peninsula in the Middle Ages. The lions native to Iraq and Iran, which is ancient Persia. As a matter of fact, lions were kept in the Tower of London by King John as early as the 13th century, and they were probably stocked with lions from an earlier menagerie started in 1125 by Henry I at his palace in Woodstock near Oxford. Lions are even painted on the walls of the famous Chauvet Cave in France. There are Indian lions, yes, there are lions in India as well as tigers, and they're still there today. Lions that are classified as Asiatic lions. There are the now extinct lions of China, which are represented in literally thousands of carvings in every major city of China today. There are at least eight major subspecies of lions living today, although some strains of lions have become extinct. There are even white lions that are not albinos living in and around the Kruger National Park in South Africa. Lions. The lion is an animal that God clearly spread around the world following the flood of Noah, unlike the kangaroo, the aardvark, the armadillo, or the platypus. And I hope we can see that God has a reason for doing that. When I was in China last summer to help my daughter and her husband adopt two precious little Chinese boys, we saw carved stone lions everywhere that we went from the north of China to the south, all over China. I think that it's instructive that God chose to put lions almost everywhere in the world so that people would understand the two great opponents in the heavenly warfare, the royal lion and the imposter lion. There is the regal lion who is the king of the universe. There is the dangerous and deadly counterfeit lion who pretends to have power, majesty, and glory of the king. God's word describes for us the difference in those lions. Although it's not our focus for today, it's also of great interest that God has chosen to use the lion to speak symbolically of his chosen people, national Israel, in the Old Testament. In fact, if I've counted correctly, there are more references to national Israel and Jerusalem as a lion than there are references to Christ as the Lion of God. We'll only look at a few of those today to stress certain points about Jesus as the King of the Jews, for the Lion speaks of kingship, and the King of Israel. Jesus is the Lion of the tribe of Judah that will literally reign from Jerusalem, the city of the great King, during his millennial rule on earth. And just as the lion is the king of beasts, so national Israel will be, as we'll see prophetically, the head of the nations during the millennium when Jesus rules there in all of his majesty. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2. It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house, that's the temple mount, that's Mount Zion in Jerusalem, shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. That's repeated in Micah chapter 4, verse 1. But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow into it. Not only national Israel under its great King Jesus is called a lion, 
But five times the city of Jerusalem is called Ariel. You can hear the sound in that. Ariel in Isaiah 29. Literally that name translated means Lion of God. And the city of Jerusalem is called the Lion of God by its Hebrew name. That's a name that I, by the way, gave to my eldest son. His middle name, Uzziah, or Uzziah, as we would say it in English, means my strength is Jehovah. So together his name means Lion of God, my strength is Jehovah. Each of my children I chose by the grace of God to give them names that would declare the glory of God. So now I think you'll understand, and I hope you will, the awesome power and strength of a lion, but let me give you just a few facts first. Small male lions are eight feet six inches long. I don't think any of us are that tall. An average male lion can easily kill prey weighing up to 1,000 pounds. You are small meat for that lion. Big male lions have measured 11 feet 7 inches long. The average big lion weighs up to 570 pounds. How much do you weigh? The Guinness Book of World Records lists the largest documented wild lion as 822.3 pounds, killed by a man named Lennox Anderson in 1936 near Hector Spuel, Transvaal, South Africa. The Guinness record for a captive lion was recorded in 1973, a whopping 826.7 pounds. Lions in southern Tanzania in the 1940s ate between 1,200 and 1,500 people in one country in Africa in the 1940s. American and Tanzanian scientists report that man-eating behavior in rural areas of Tanzania increased greatly from 1990 to 2005. At least 563 villagers were attacked and eaten during this period. Many Mozambican refugees regularly crossing the Kruger National Park at night in South Africa are attacked and eaten by lions. And let me give you an interesting quote. quote Park officials have conceded that man-eating is a problem here. <laughs> I would guess. Don't walk through the park. Lions are mentioned more than 100 times in scripture, but we'll only have time to look at a few of those references today. The first place that I'd like to take you is that passage that Elder Swain referenced when he spoke of Balaam's talking donkey. Surprisingly, national Israel is portrayed as a lion in two of Balaam's prophecies. The first key verse is Numbers 23-24. It's the final verse in Balaam's second prophecy about Israel. You remember, he had been called by Balak to curse Israel. And you heard the story about the donkey and all the things the donkey did to try to save his life and Balaam's stupidity and anger and how the donkey was smarter than Balaam. Great message. But God let him go, but God said, you're going to say what I tell you to say. And three times he tried to curse Israel. Balak really wanted Israel cursed because he'd seen what God had been doing with Israel. And Balaam never could because God gave him a different word. And here we have, it's verse 24, this is what it says. Behold, the people shall rise up as a great lion and lift up himself as a young lion. He shall not lie down until he eat of the prey and drink the blood of the slain. Now, in preparing for this message, I read a lot about lions. They are scary creatures. We tend not to consider it as such because we see them safely in zoos. They are massive, monstrous, vicious creatures. Now, listen to the context of that verse. Starting in verse 16, The Lord met Balaam and put a word in his mouth and said, Go again unto Balak and say thus, and when he came to him, behold, he stood by his burnt offering and the princes of Moab with him. And Balak said unto him, What hath the Lord spoken? And he took up his parable and said, Rise up, Balak, and hear. Hearken unto me, thou son of Tippor. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Behold, I have received commandment to bless, and he hath blessed, and I cannot reverse it. He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob. Now that is an interesting statement there. 
sinful Israel, but God looks through his son. Neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. God brought them out of Egypt. He hath, as it were, the strength of an unicorn. Surely there is no enchantment against Jacob, neither is there any divination against Israel. According to this time it shall be said of Jacob and of Israel, What hath God wrought? <laughs> Let me pause for just a moment. Were you aware that the very first words spoken over the very first telephone by Alexander Graham Bell were found in a prophecy of Balaam blessing Israel? Some of you have studied Alexander Graham Bell and the invention of the telephone. Those are the very first words that were spoken over a telephone line out of a prophecy of Balaam. I suspect Alexander Graham Bell knew something of scripture. Verse 24, Behold, the people shall rise up as a great lion and lift up himself as a young lion. He shall not lie down until he eat the prey and drink the blood of the slain. And Balak said unto Balaam, Neither curse them at all, nor bless them at all. And Balaam answered and said unto Balak, Told not I thee, saying, All that the Lord speaketh, that I must do. Good lesson for us to learn. Balaam sort of resisted at first. Balaam finally got doing what he was supposed to be doing. Balaam ultimately figured out a way to get God to judge Israel by having the Moabitish girls commit fornication with the Israelite men, and so God killed a bunch of them. And so Balaam got his reward. Three months later, the scripture tells us specifically that when Israel invaded the land, its land, it says, Balaam, the son of Bosser, they slew with the sword. He got his money, he got his reward, and he died for it. Young people, it does not pay to disobey God. It does not pay to go the way of the world, to live by covetousness, to live by immorality. The wages of sin is death. Even for God's people, those of you who are Christian young people, the wages of sin is death. The second key verse is in chapter 24, one chapter later, verse 9. It's the final verse in Balaam's third prophecy about Israel. He couched, he lay down as a lion, and as a great lion, who shall stir him up? Blessed is he that blesseth thee, and cursed is he that curseth thee. Isn't that interesting? Were you aware that this key part of the Abrahamic covenant, which was made for the very first time in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, to Abraham, is repeated here in the blessing of Balaam on national Israel? Remember the first prophecy, he said, God is not a man that he should lie. If he's promised to do it, he's going to do it. Dear people, be very careful in the way you treat the promises to national Israel. We see some very severe warnings here as we look at Balaam. Listen to the context. When Balaam saw it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he went not, as at other times, to seek for enchantments, but he set his face toward the wilderness. And Balaam lifted up his eyes, and he saw Israel abiding in his tents according to their tribes, and the Spirit of God came upon him. And he took up his parable and said, Balaam the son of Beor hath said, and the man whose eyes are open hath said, He hath said, which heard the word of God, which saw the vision of the Almighty falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. How goodly are thy tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacles, O Israel! As the valleys are they spread forth, as gardens by the riverside, as the trees of lin aloes, which the Lord hath planted, and as cedar trees beside the waters. He shall pour the water out of his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters, and his kings shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom be exalted. God brought him forth out of Egypt. He hath, as it were, the strength of an unicorn. He shall eat up the nations, his enemies. He shall break their bones and pierce them through with his arrows. He couched, he lay down as a lion, and as a great lion, who shall stir him up? Blessed is he that blesseth thee, and cursed is he that curseth thee. God's word tells us that national Israel is a lion. 
Another thought about that, the lion in scripture not only speaks of God as the king, the lion in scripture speaks of God as the all-powerful judge. For example, God used a lion to judge a disobedient prophet. In just a moment, I hope we'll see that there's also a very serious implication as we consider Jesus, the lion of the tribe of Judah, who is also the judge. You remember that there was a man of God that was sent by God to Jeroboam, who had set up some idols in the northern kingdom, which was known as Israel, and the southern kingdom known as Judah. And he had an altar, and the man of God went up there and cursed the altar. And Jeroboam said, arrest that man, and Jeroboam's hand was withered up. And he said, pray to God for me that my hand will get restored. And so the hand was restored. And then he said, uh, come home and I'll give you lunch. And the man of God said, no, I can't do that. If I go home with you and eat lunch, I'll be disobeying God. And so he turned down an offer from the king to have lunch with the king. Now, if one of you had an offer from uh, a senator or representative or a president that you like uh, happened to invite you home for lunch, uh, I suspect most of us would be tempted to go. He said, no, I can't go. God told me not to go home and have lunch with you. And the man of God said unto the king, if thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go in with thee. Neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so it was charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, eat no bread nor drink water nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. So he went another way and returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. Now here we have perhaps the second worst hypocrite in the Bible. First, I would consider Judas, but perhaps this is the second worst hypocrite in the Bible. There is an old prophet who's living at Bethel. He's a man who knows God, but he's a man who has gotten along with the paganism around him. He's never caused waves. But it tells us he's a man of God and he's going to get a word from God in just a second. There dwelt an old prophet at Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel, the words which he had spoken unto the king, them they also told to their father. That father had never stood up and taken a stand for the Jehovah God of Israel. He'd lived right in town. He was where the king lived. He knew the true God, and he was a chicken. How many of us are chickens? And how many of us end up being hypocrites? We'll see that with this man here in just a second. And the father said unto them, What way went he? For his sons had seen what way the man of God went, which came from Judah. And he said unto his sons, Saddle me the ass. Oh, just like with Balaam. So they saddled him the ass, and he rode thereon, and went after the man of God, and found him sitting under an oak. Dear people, if you are sent on an errand by God and he tells you to go and to come, don't tarry along the way. It may get you into trouble. And he said unto him, Art thou the man of God that camest from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said unto him, Come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I may not return with thee, nor go in with thee. Neither will I eat bread nor drink water with thee in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, Thou shalt eat no bread nor drink water there, to, nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. He knows the message. That's the prophet who got the message. He knows what God said. Now he's going to hear something from another man who claims to be a man of God. He, that is this old prophet, said unto him, I'm a prophet also as thou art. And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord. You know, the New Testament talks about angels of light. It says, though we are an angel from heaven, preach unto you any other gospel than that which you have received, receive him not. You know why? Because Satan himself appears as an angel of light. One of the messages mentioned that. It's no great thing if his ministers appear as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. There are a lot of people who stand in pulpits all over the United States and around the world who are not preaching the true gospel of Christ. Here's an old man who claims to be a prophet of God. And he said, hey, I'm just like you. 
And an angel spoke unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. Last phrase in the verse. But he lied to him. We learned yesterday that Satan is a liar. He's a deceiver. So he went back with him and did eat bread in his house and drank water. And it came to pass as they sat at the table that the word of the Lord did indeed come unto the prophet that brought him back. <laughs> and he cried out unto the man of God that came from Judah saying, Thus saith the Lord, for as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord and hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God commanded thee, but camest back and hast eaten bread and drunk water in the place of the which the Lord did say to thee, Eat no bread, drink no water. Thy carcass shall not come unto the sepulcher of thy fathers. And it came to pass, after he had eaten bread and after he had drunk, that he saddled the ass for him, to wit, for the prophet whom he brought back. The guy said, okay, you can take my donkey. You know, I don't want you to have to walk all that way back. You know, get on my donkey. And when he was gone, a lion met him by the way and slew him. And his carcass was cast in the way. Now here's something supernatural, just like with Balaam's ass. The ass stood by it, and the lion also stood by the carcass. And behold, men passed by and saw the carcass cast in the way, and the lion standing by the carcass. And they came and told him in the city where the old prophet dwelt. And when the prophet that brought him back from the way heard thereof, he said, It is the man of God who was disobedient unto the word of the Lord. Therefore the Lord hath delivered him unto the lion, which hath torn him and slain him, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake unto him. And he spake to his son, saying, Saddle me the ass, and they saddled him. And he went and found his carcass cast in the way, and the ass and the lion standing by the carcass. The lion had not eaten the carcass nor torn the ass. Now can you imagine walking up and here's a lion standing there and a donkey standing there and a dead body. And you just sort of ho-hum, go over and pick up the dead body, pack it on the donkey, and head back home while the lion watches you. <laughs> Folks, there's some supernatural going on here. Not just supernatural, but it's demonstrating the principle that the lion is also a symbol of God's judgment. And he laid his carcass in his own grave, and they mourned over him, saying, Alas, my brother, and it came to pass after they had buried him that he spake to his son, saying, When I am dead, then bury me in the sepulcher wherein the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones, because this saying that he spoke is surely going to come to pass. You know, that's not the only instance in the Bible where God used a lion to judge a disobedient man. The same thing happened to another man who refused to obey the Lord in the days of Ben-Hadad and Ahab. 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 36. I'll not read the entire passage, but uh, we have a situation where Ben-Hadad has lost the war. His servants tell him you'll probably find mercy because the kings of Israel are known to be merciful kings. And so he goes out to him with a rope around his neck and doing obeisance and... Uh, the, uh, the king of Israel says, uh, oh, my brother. And so they said, ah, oh, he's going to find mercy. And he lets him go. And so one of the prophets says to a man out of the army, he says, um, you know, hit me in the face, beat me up a little bit. The guy says, I'm not going to do it. And then he said unto him, because thou hast not obeyed the voice of the Lord, behold, as soon as thou art departed from me, a lion shall slay thee. And as soon as he was departed from him, a lion found him and slew him. The lion gives us a beautiful symbol in scripture of judgment. God using it to judge. Now, why are these two stories for us so significant when we consider our righteous lion? I think it's a reminder to us that God is the lion who judges his people. And Jesus said that the Father hath committed all judgment into the hands of the Son. John 5. 
For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. That all men should honor the Son. Now, the Son is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Remember that. Even as they honor the Father, he that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, that is, will not fall under judgment, but is passed from death unto life. Jumping down a few verses. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Remember, in this context, that there is a sin unto death even for believers today, including young people. There is a sin unto death. We have a lion who is not only the king, we have a lion who is also a righteous judge. Not merely a judge of those who are the unregenerate, who are on their way to hell, but listen to what Hebrews 10.30 says. For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. James 1 verse 5, Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. John explains that in 1 John chapter 5. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. Don't even pray for somebody like that. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin that is not unto death. We have some illustrations of the sin unto death where God uses death to judge his own people. Remember, the lion is also the judge. For example, you hear it often. You hear it at least whenever your church holds the Lord's table. 1 Corinthians 11, 28, Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Verse 30, For this cause... Many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. That means God had judged them because they were coming to the Lord's table with unconfessed sin. God had actually made some of them sick. God had made some of them weak. God had killed some of them because they refused to repent of their sins before they came to partake of the Lord's table. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. By the way, did you know that in one case at least of the sin unto death, it includes being thrown to the enemy lion? We've all heard about people being thrown to the lions. Did you know that God made a provision to throw you to the lions? in at least one kind of sin, and in this case, to your great adversary, the devil, who has a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith. Did you know you can get thrown to the enemy lion? Listen to this, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, sexual immorality, and such fornication is not so much named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily, as absent in body but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present, concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, and my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, now here it is, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. He's talking about Christians who are involved in sexual immorality and the church throwing them to the lion. 
your adversary the devil to turn such an one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus you know all of us to some extent reflect the characteristics and the character qualities of our parents you can't get away from it you're genetic related to them did you know that evil men reflect the character of their spiritual father the devil the imposter lion the roaring lion who devours Jesus said so in John chapter 8 begin verse 39 they answered and said unto him Abraham is our father Jesus saith unto them if you were Abraham's children he would do the works of Abraham children tend to reflect their parents but now you seek to kill me a man that hath told you the truth which I've heard of God this did not Abraham ye do the deeds of your father evil people reflect the character of their spiritual father the devil they said unto him we're not born of fornication we have one father even God Jesus said unto them if God were your father you would love me you know what if you don't love Jesus God is not your father Jesus just said so if God were your father he would love me for I proceeded forth and came from God neither came I of myself but he sent me why don't you understand my speech even because you cannot hear my word ye are of your father the devil Jesus doesn't make any bones about it folks you can't be a wishy-washy gray area halfway almost there kind of a person you're either one of his or you're one of the devils and the lusts of your father ye will do he was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him when he speaketh a lie he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it did you know that every time you speak a lie you're trusting the devil to get you out of the tight situation in which you find yourself Jesus said I'm the way the truth and the life when you speak the truth you're trusting Christ to get you out of the situation when you tell a lie you're trusting the devil to get you out of that situation he's a liar and the father of it there are many many illustrations of this in the scripture where the wicked reflect the character of the wicked lion imposter for example Psalm 10 9 he lieth and waits secretly as a lion in his den he lieth and wait to catch the poor he doth catch the poor when he draweth him into his net Psalm 17 12 like as a lion that is greedy of his prey and as it were a young lion lurking in secret places here's one you know Psalm 22 a great messianic Psalm they gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion as quoted in the New Testament as a prophecy regarding the crucifixion and Pastor Sidwell spoke of this when he spoke of the serpent bruising the heel of the Messiah Psalm 22 21 save me from the lion's mouth for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorn I'm going to tell you a story I've only got five minutes I know this you know God has given us some very powerful examples of the evil lion the usurper Satan in real life let me tell you a true story from Kenya the British Empire was trying to expand across East Africa by building a railroad from Kenya to Lake Victoria and then on to Uganda the entire power of the British Empire ground to a halt for nine months in 1898 by two giant lions who killed and ate 135 people before they were killed by Lieutenant Colonel John Henry Patterson the natives called those two lions the ghost and the darkness because they thought they were demons for nine months Colonel Patterson tried to track them down and killed them as they systematically every night jumped into the campsites which were heavily armed and dragged people out sometimes only 30 feet away from the campfire to crunch them to death the rest of the world knew them as the man-eaters of Tsavo, Kenya, Africa. And by the way, I have some pictures here. Some of you might like to see pictures of these lions afterwards because they've been stuffed uh, after they were killed. And they've been mounted in the Field Museum in Chicago for many years. But uh, here's the face of one of them. Here's Colonel Patterson uh, on the day that he killed one of them. I got a nice picture of him there. Uh, so if you guys want to see that afterwards, you're welcome to come up and do it. As you'll see, the giant lions in the area of Kenya have no mane. 
You know, most male lions, and certainly the lions that we like to look at in the zoo, the male lions have a big, puffy, hairy mane. The stuffed bodies of both lions have been on display in the museum for almost a century now. But you know, it's still going on. In January 2010, Paul Raffaele from the Smithsonian Institute magazine reported that when he arrived in Nairobi, word had just arrived that a woman had been killed and eaten in Savo that week. And a cattle herder had been devoured weeks earlier. He was told, quote, that's not unusual at Savo. I'm going to read you just a little bit of that history. I think I brought it up here with me. If I don't, oh, there it is. Oh, and here's another picture of those lions. Let me read you just a little bit of this. You'll begin to understand what our adversary, the devil, is like and why it is so necessary for you to come under the protection of the royal lion, the Lord Jesus Christ. Back in 1898, the British decided to build a railroad in East Africa. The railroad would stretch from Mombasa on the coast of modern-day Kenya to Lake Victoria and later to Uganda. This railroad, called the Uganda Railroad, was also referred to as the Lunatic Line. It was said by its opponents to go from nowhere to utterly nowhere. This railroad did have some legitimate purpose to exist. In those days, the only route into the interior of the African continent was on foot. There was much in the way of agricultural goods and other wares that could be not easily reached, uh, reach market due to the lack of transportation. Missionaries had considerable trouble reaching the rich fields in Central Africa. Finally, there was a nagging slave problem. It was hoped that good transportation would encourage people living in the interior of the continent that there were better ways of making a living than capturing slaves. Construction started in 1896 and reached what is today Nairobi in 1899. It finally reached Kismu on Lake Victoria in 1901. It took 27 more years for the railroad to actually be extended to Kampala, Uganda. The railroad still runs today. If you're a tourist in Kenya at any time, you can actually buy a ticket uh, on that rail line. But the incredible story deals with only a tiny part of that monumental project, the construction of a bridge across the Tsavo River about 132 miles northwest of Mombasa. By the way, here's another picture of the lion. In September 1991, not too long ago, while on a hunting safari in Zambia, Africa, Wayne Hosick was asked by the locals if he could help hunt down a man-eating lion that had been terrorizing the town of Mawafi. Wayne agreed to take on the task. With some serious effort put forth, the lion was finally shot about two weeks later. It turned out to be a spectacular specimen, the largest man-eating lion ever recorded. Like the Tsavo man-eaters, it too was a maneless male. It had no mane. Later, Wayne had this lion mounted, taxidermy work done by noted taxidermist Bob Snow. He then donated it to the Field Museum and it went on display in 1999. So you can see that lion there too. But back to the story regarding the devil's lions or the demon lions, as they were known in Savo. Patterson, that's Colonel John Henry Patterson who killed those lions, was still a young man in his early 30s. He'd recently come from India, having overseen some civil engineering projects there. In any case, he arrived in Mombasa March 1st, 1898, knowing he was to be somehow involved with the construction of the Uganda Railway. A week later, he was ordered to proceed to Tsavo and oversee the construction of the railway project. It was not many days after Colonel Patterson arrived that reports started coming in about workers disappearing. Although it was told him that lions were responsible, Patterson at first didn't believe it. When he finally investigated, it was quickly and gruesomely discovered that not one, but two lions were responsible for killing the workers. Early attempts to shoot the lions were unsuccessful. The lions seemed to be able to predict what Patterson would do next. The workers constructed thorn bomas, which is a thorn fence erected around a dwelling or a corral designed to keep the predators out, around their camps and kept fires burning at night to scare off the lions, but it didn't work. The lions totally ignored the thorns and had dragged themselves and their meals right through them. Still, there were a couple of lucky escapes. One night, a lion attacked a man riding a donkey. Interesting. The donkey was knocked over and the man knocked off. The lion moved in for the kill and somehow got its claws hooked in the rope tied to some oil cans that had been around the donkey's neck. The lion couldn't immediately figure out how to unhook the rope and the oil cans were making such a terrible racket that the noise frightened the lion so much that it ran back into the bush, dragging the oil cans with it. The rider escaped to the safety of a tree and stayed there the rest of the night. Another time, one of the lions broke into a tent and was intent on carrying off the occupant who was sleeping on a mattress. Instead, somehow the lion got hold of the mattress and pulled it out from under the man. Soon realizing its mistake, the lion dropped the mattress and ran off. Another time, one of the lions jumped into a tent containing 14 Indian coolies. 
The lion broke through the tent, clawing up one man's shoulder in the process. Somehow in the ensuing confusion, the lion grabbed a sack of rice and made off with that instead. The lion threw it down in disgust a short distance away. Do you think this would have been an exciting place to work? How many of you would like to work on this particular job? Oh, we have at least one hand down there. All right. One night, one of the lions attacked the hospital tent. At first, he was scared away when the doctor's assistants knocked over a cabinet of supplies in the fright. But the lion tried again. Breaking through the tent, he seized one of the patients and injured two other patients. It was decided after to move that hospital tent. The very next night, the lion attacked the new hospital tent. Many of its occupants got to witness the lion seize, kill, and drag through the thorn boma, the hospital's water carrier. The next day, as was usually the case for these lions, all that was left of the water carrier was his head, a few of the larger bones, and part of one of his hands. Every night, Colonel Patterson and others would stay up hoping to get a shot at one of the lions. They never did. The lions were getting bolder. Some nights they would each take a victim so they wouldn't have to share. They could go undetected right through the thorn fences. One night, a bunch of coolies escaped the lions in the safety of a tree, but they so heavily loaded the tree that it collapsed, throwing them to the ground very close to the lions. But the lions didn't care. They'd already caught a victim and were too busy feasting on him. One night, the lions caught a victim and carried it close to Colonel Patterson's camp to devour it. He vividly remembers the sounds of bones being crunched and the contented purring. It took days to get those sounds out of his head. Well, I think you get the idea. You might want to read about the lions of Savo. You know, in Africa, those two lions were thought of as demons. The rest of the world knew them as the man-eaters of Savo, Kenya, Africa. In January of 2010, there are still lions out there. In June 2014, that type of lion is still there. That's the kind of lion that reminds you of your adversary, the devil. Never think of him as a tame pussycat. He will get through your defenses. He will drag you off screaming. And he will crunch you in the sight of other people. Now we have a contrast. God's people instead reflect the character of their lion father who tramples the evil lion and the serpent and the dragon. All three of those were titles that were given to Satan and Pastor Sidwell talked about them. Did you know that all three of those are listed in one context, in one verse, in Psalm 91? And a promise is made, and in context it refers both to Christ as our lion head and us as those who are his whelps, if you will. Listen to what it says. And you'll see all three of them. Thou shalt tread upon the lion, there the lion, and the adder, there's the snake, the young lion, and the dragon, there's the third one, shalt thou trample under feet. The lion is also the symbol of the king's wrath. Christ is our king, the king of kings and the lord of lords. Proverbs 19:12. the king's wrath is as the roaring of a lion, but his favor is as dew upon the grass. Chapter 20, verse 2, the fear of the king is as the roaring of a lion. Whoso provoketh him to anger sinneth against his own soul. Job, chapter 10, verse 16, for it increaseth, thou huntest me as a fierce lion, and again thou showest thyself marvelous upon me. So back to what we were saying at the beginning. Lions spread all over the world. There's a reason for it. God did it for a reason. Because he's giving natural revelation, the light of creation, to all the world. We're told that in Psalm 19. We're told that in Romans chapter 1. You see, the lion is central in the sovereign plan of God to be a symbol of royalty and kings, and that is true around the world. The world has that light of creation pointing to the true king, the true God. The lion was a symbol of royalty in ancient Egypt. The Nemean lion was a symbol of royalty in ancient Greek and Rome. Leo, the symbol of royalty in the Zodiac. The lion was a symbol of royalty in ancient Sumerian civilization. The symbol of kingship in Assyria in Babylonia was the striding lion of Babylon. And some of you have seen the walls of Babylon, uh, how they have the lions actually built in as bas-reliefs, this walking lion on the sides of the walls of Babylon. Symbol, it was the lion, it was a symbol of kingship in Persia. The very common name in India, Singh, S-I-N-G-H, means lion and dates back to the ancient royal military caste. Lions are found on multiple national flags and coats of arms. The lion is a national emblem of India. The lion is a symbol of Sri, Sri Lanka with the words meaning people with lion's blood. The city of Singapore derives its name from the words meaning lion fortress. 
In Europe, multiple kings claimed the title of lion. You all know of Richard the Lionhearted, Henry the Lion, Duke of Saxony, William the Lion, King of Scotland, Robert III of Flanders, nicknamed the Lion of Flanders. The national icon of Flanders up to the present is the lion. The throne chairs of Denmark and Norway depict the lion. The royal coat of arms of Denmark and Norway depict the lion. The shield of Jerusalem, the city, very appropriately, is the lion rampant. Do people all over the world know about the lion? Do they understand the lion as a symbol of royalty? I think so. I've given you only a few of the examples. There are massive encyclopedia uh, articles on this. God burned the lion into the hearts of people around the world to emblazon in their minds that there is a true lion king. Even the cartoons know that, the lion king, I'm sure you've seen. And there's a war between the imposter lion and the regal lion. The lion of the tribe of Judah is a warrior lion and will fight for Mount Zion in Jerusalem at the second coming. Isaiah 31 verse 4, For thus hath the Lord spoken unto me, Like as the lion and the young lion roaring on his prey when the multitude of shepherds is called forth against him, he will not be afraid of their voice nor abuse himself for the noise of them. So the Lord of hosts will come down to fight for Mount Zion and for the hill thereof. And where does he start? Of course, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Zechariah 12, the Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. In that day, the Lord shall defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. And shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Oh, I wish I had time to talk more about that subject. Chapter 14, you know, deals with it in detail. The Lord shall go forth, fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. His feet shall stand upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. The Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. There should be a very great valley. Half of the mountain shall remove to the north and half of it toward the south. Where did Jesus go up into heaven? Mount of Olives. Acts chapter 1, verses 8 through 11. And what are the angels, the men who stood by them in white apparel, say to them? Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Where did he go up from? Mount of Olives. Where does it prophesy in Zechariah chapter 14 that he will come back? Mount of Olives. The lion of the tribe of Judah coming back to deliver his people. Verse 9, and the Lord shall be king, this is the end of that passage, the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day there shall be one Lord and his name one. It is the Lord Jesus Christ who is the true lion of the tribe of Judah. Listen to these two prophecies. Hosea chapter 11, they shall walk after the Lord. He shall roar like a lion. When he shall roar, then shall the children tremble from the west. Amos 3, 8, the lion hath roared who will not fear. The Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy? And that brings us back, of course, to our key verse in Revelation 3, 5. The Lion of the tribe of Judah, who is the Lamb of God, that takes away the sin of the world. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. And what do they all sing? They sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book. Thou art worthy. He is the lion because he first was the lamb. He has the right and the authority to take the book of judgment. Remember, the lion is not merely the king. The lion is the judge. And he takes the book of judgment with its seven seals and opens them so that judgment might be poured out upon the earth. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and hast made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. 
The day is coming, folks. Are you a Christian? These are some promises that you can look forward to with eagerness and anticipation. The very God of heaven, God who cannot lie, as we saw already in those Old Testament prophecies about the lion of the tribe of Judah, has made to you. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing in every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that in them are heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And all of God's people said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Praise God. The lion of the tribe of Judah is the victor over the imposter lion who has tried to usurp the throne of the true king of the universe. Even our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our gracious Father, Again, we thank you for your word and for its power. How we thank you that our Lord Jesus Christ is indeed the lion of the tribe of Judah. There is a usurper on the prowl. There is a usurper seeking to destroy people, seeking to capture, if possible, even some of these precious young people here in this auditorium today. Oh, Father, I pray for their souls. Let not the adversary have them. Deliver them by the power of your Son, Jesus Christ. Let them trust him for their safety and come under the shelter of his great and mighty kingship. Take your word, Father. Let it not return unto you void. Let it accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning, if I can find the bulletin, I have zillions of